think I should tell him, Kyle? Perhaps you're right. You often make good suggestions, and I think this might be one of them. Darby cast, Wild Card Friday, and I'm going to come out guns blazing with a lot of honesty. I worked out today with the adjustable weight kettlebell made by Bowflex, and it felt so good. It felt incredible. Not only did I do kettlebell swings, but I did vertical rows, single arm rows, a little bit of uh, Romanian deadlift. Cat's out of the bag, huh, Kyle? Honesty is the best policy, that's what they say. But hey, Darby Cast doctors, here you are on a Friday. And at this point, I don't even know what's really going on in this world of ours. I'm assuming next week will be full of fireworks and nonsense. But that's pretty much par for the course where we're at. But that's why the Darby cast exists. So we can poke fun at the goings on of the world and breathe a little bit easier and say yes to things like adjustable weight Bowflex kettlebells and yes to saying hello to a stranger and saying yes to seeing a idiot kid committing arson and being like, don't do that. These are all the things that the Darby cast is about. It's true. But let's get into it. Let me just take you through a guided meditation. I know on most of the Darby cast, what I do is I talk about other people, made up people, fictitious beings with names that I choose pretty much off the cuff. And that plays in a huge way. But a couple of times, I put you in the driver's seat where I issue you a challenge and I say, I dare you. I challenge you to close your eyes and let the imagery envelop you. Let it give you a warm embrace or a frosty hug of inappropriateness. If you're a longtime listener of the Darby cast, boy, have you received a few too many frosty hugs of inappropriateness. But they've always been worth it because the frosty hug always melts into the warmest embrace you could ever imagine. The embrace of laughter, friendship, truth, honesty, integrity, high ethics, good cardio, strong arms, but not at the expense of strong legs. If you're newer to the Darby cast, right now you might be saying to yourself, how have you managed to make as many episodes as you have? And that's not the worst question I've ever heard. I'm astonished that there's over two days of riveting content that has come out of the Darby cast. Let's take a moment to appreciate all the people who make that possible, namely my wonderful editor who continues to listen to these before they get released in the event that I say something that is a little bit too over the top. Oh, yeah, I go there. I go there. But she helps keep the brand in the correct lane and say, that joke was a little too crude. Why don't you uh, reel that back in? Or you went a little too hard there. You lost sight of what was important. And we all need that, right? We should all be so lucky as to have someone that we can bounce things off of, whether it's in a creative capacity or otherwise, maybe just a personal capacity. You know, there's a lot of people struggling with mental health these days, and there's also a lot of therapists out there. But a lot of those therapists are complete dog shit. They don't know what they're doing. They can't help you. Why? Because they haven't figured out how to help themselves yet. Whew. Big call out, right? Kyle is nodding his head. He knows. He went to a crap shrink once. It was a waste of money. That's what it was, wasn't it, Kyle? Two things to really right the ship of being bummed out. There's plenty of things to be bummed out in this world of ours. Make no mistake about it. Actually, about three things that can really correct it. Honesty, friendship, and weights. 
that will just make you into the person that you're meant to be. Speak with candor. Find people who want the best for you. And throw around some steel. Huh? That'll do you just right. But let me give another shout out to Kyle. Kyle, you are such a hero for being on this adventure with me. You are the Pippin to my Jordan. You are the Robin to my Batman. You are my Sister Act 2 to my Sister Act. I don't know if that last one plays because I never saw either of those movies, but it felt right to say it at the time. But now that all of you are in the correct mindset to listen, learn, laugh, and love, the four L's. Now that you're ready to do that, let me give you a warm embrace and a frosty embrace and then another warm embrace. Very odd temperature hugs coming straight at you into the ear hole. That's what this podcast is. That's what it is. That's what it always has been. And if you don't really understand what that means, go back in the catalog. Listen to an episode that you maybe haven't listened to before. Or maybe you go listen to an old favorite. That's it, right? That's it. You'll figure it out soon enough, but let's get after it. With that lengthy preamble that wasted a lot of time, I didn't mean to do such a thing. And let me correct myself because that wasn't a waste of time. Nothing's a waste of time when it comes to talking to the Darby Cast doctors. It isn't. I've got to keep you guys, you all, as a unit. I have to keep you in the know, in high spirits, thriving, doing it right. But let the imagery of this story envelop you. Let it flood your mind's eye. And see how that goes, right? Torrential downpour of high quality imagery raining all over your mind. Wow, there's imagery for you and we haven't even gotten into it yet, right? It happens so routinely on the Darby cast where many of the listeners have to wonder constantly, like what's with all this off the cuff slam poetry? I'm going to tell you this is just how I talk. There's no bells and whistles and gimmicks to it. This is why people love the Darby cast, but let's get into it. Okay, so let's put you as the central focus of this story. Imagine yourself, all the details. Imagine all this happening for you, to you in some cases. Sink your imagination into the shoes that I am about to describe a serious walkabout in. Does that make sense? It sure does. Okay. So you, a great person, a Darby cast doctor, are hosting a dinner party. Sounds pretty nice, right? Your wife or husband, uh, for the lady listeners, for one reason or another, has demanded that you need to go to the airport and invite everyone you see from the international terminal to your house for this party. You scratch your head and you're like, hey, what, uh, babe? Why? Why? And they don't give you a proper answer back, which is unsettling. But you're a team player, so you go for it. You go to that international terminal and you see people getting off planes from all the far reaches of the globe. Many of these people give you odd looks when you hand them a card that says, you're invited with your address. Some of them don't even speak English. In fact, about 73% of them do not. And you're like, what am I even doing here? Why am I passing out invites to the people at the international terminal? I'm sure they already have plans. They're traveling internationally. They're probably big shots, right? You get home, you tell your spouse, you say, hey, I gave out all the invites. And then your spouse is like, okay, I will give you manual sex. That's either a hand job or fingering, depending on who you are, what your gender is, what your sex is, one and the same. So the big dinner party is the following weekend. And your spouse insists 
demands even, that you need to dip into your children's college fund so you can greet the guests properly by handing them an envelope of cash when they arrive at your house, as is customary for a international house party, I guess. But let's give a little backstory to the house that you call home. Your house was built by your great-grandpappy Norton. A simple man from humble beginnings, Norton got his first job selling soda pop at church functions, right before he went off to WW1 to lay waste to some jerks. What an alpha, right, Norton? So cool. When he came back, he married your grandma, Ethel, without a second thought. It's just, yeah, done deal. Ethel, you smoke show. I think you're going to be good for the house. And that's it. That's what he said to Ethel. That's what Norton said to Ethel. And truly, she was just a remarkable human being. The kind of gal that could make an apple pie, even if she only had bananas at the house. Do you see how cool that sort of grandma is? So Norton gets back from WW1, and surprisingly, he doesn't have overwhelming amounts of PTSD nor the desire to live a life of carnage, chaos, and death. He just comes back and he's like, all right, well, what do I do? Deep down, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a concert pianist out of respect for his childhood hero, Mozart. And I will tell you, not a whole lot of other children were trying to emulate Mozart at this time, nor are they now. I'm just going to call that out. Norton, however, pragmatic as they come, war vet, decided that there wasn't a ton of money in piano chicanery. He wasn't wrong. So he opted to team up with his closest friends from the Great War and start a lumberyard slash carpentry slash construction business. Wow. Norton, very smart. Way to optimize every phase of wood finishing. You can do it all. That's Norton for you. So everyone in town loved Norton. Surprise, surprise, the guy's an amazing human being. Not just because he put the same level of effort into his business as he would have at pursuing Mozart-like piano skills, but because he never forgot about what got him started out in the world in the first place. Selling pop. That's right. So with every sale, didn't matter what the sale was, couple of two by fours or a full order for a house or, you know, maybe a cabinet or something. Didn't matter the order size. Norton would throw in a comped bottle of Coca-Cola Classic in a glass bottle, real cane sugar. And nobody ever took advantage of that by manipulating Norton into just dishing out sodas. You need 22 by fours. You're going to buy them one at a time so you can end up with 20 of his Cokes. Nobody was doing that. Nobody wanted to try to pull a fast one on Norton. You just don't. You don't. He had a lot of respect in the community. He's a glue guy. Really good dude. So as Norton was well on his way to cementing himself in the history books, as a great guy in such an absurd amount of categories that made the village drunks into bigger village drunks out of hopelessness, that they would ever amount to anything that remotely resembled Norton. Not just on Norton's best days, either. We're talking Norton's worst days. Norton, at his worst, still way out of reach for most people. He was just that impressive. Let me put it to you this way. July 5th, morning of, he's hungover from going to a hootenanny with Ethel and some other friends. They all get plastered. They don't do this often. They do it for the 4th of July. It's their one time a year to really cut loose. July 5th, they take it pretty easy. They're not in their normal routine. But even on July 5th, Norton, he's like the archetypal 
American can-do-it attitude, community thought leader, benevolent neighbor, good dude. Just a good dude. No problems there. So with Norton's can-do attitude, a wife who was just such a value add, and a budding family with children named Olivia, Newton, and John, really laying the cultural groundwork for the future star actress who took the world by storm in the movie Grease with Travolta. Pretty cool doing that. Norton was a major force with which to be reckoned. A total glue guy. Almost an Elmer's glue guy. Or crazy glue. Minus the crazy. Just high quality, good heart glue. So what does that look like for the people around him? Not just his family, but his neighbors, his colleagues. He inspires those people to try a little bit harder, to work a little bit longer, and to avoid low ethics plays like price gouging and anti-competitive behavior in the world of all things lumber. Wow. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing Norton? What a Amazing guy. What a stand-up guy. You could ask that guy for a cup of sugar and he would say, hey, here's 20 bucks and the sugar. And you'd be like, 20 bucks is a lot of money. Remember, because this is before the dollar had really lost a lot of its value. So that was a big move, right? Whew, Norton. I get the chills just thinking about this guy. And what an amazing person he was. Now, Darby Cast doctors, I told you that this would be somewhat of a guided visualization, a guided meditation. So if you aren't doing so already, close your eyes and smile just at the thought that your grandfather was Norton. He was the guy your parents used to tell you stories about Norton. And they're like, he was so vascular. That's one thing he definitely was. Great vein tone. He ate a lot of beets, son or daughter. That's the first thing we want you to know about him before we tell you all the additional great things. But that is item number one on Norton and his list of great qualities. Are you feeling this? Are you having the emotional response that you should? Is your emotional receiver in tune? If right now you're like, ugh, Norton, boy, do you need to look at yourself in the mirror today and say, what has happened to me over the course of my life? So much psychological trauma. That's the only explanation for me not feeling amazing about having a grandpappy who put his artistic priorities aside to provide for those around him. A lot of you are probably unable to imagine being such a miswired individual, and I get that. It's hard to go into that space because right now you're probably full of butterflies and you're like, man, I'd like to go on a fishing trip with Norton. I get that. But let's go to the kids. Let's go to Norton's kids, because that's important. Let's talk about Newton and John. Huge studs. They take after their father, naturally. And they worked tirelessly to help their father craft a massive house that would afford their family the opportunity to expand the business so they could do great things for their community at large. And some of you are scratching your head right now. You're saying, how's a bigger house allow for better business? I'm glad you asked. It's so Norton and Ethel could have more great kids who would spread the good word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as well as comp a soda pop provided that the situation called for it. And they found those situations. That's 
something that was kind of like encoded into them that at age three, they just maybe spoken a few words, but the kids would toddle around and be like, Coca-Cola classic, ma'am. Great first words to hear out of your children. Really great. So you've got these great kids, God-fearing. They stand up for things like truth, hard work, and etiquette. Boy, do they just know all of the ins and outs of high-level etiquette. Not to mention, they know how to set a 13-piece dinner table placemat arrangement. They know where all those little spoons and sideways-looking forks go. They know that there's a glass for water and one for champagne, and another one for wine. What a family. My goodness, Norton, Ethel. And remember, in this scenario, those are your grandparents. It feels so good. Let that resonate with you for a second. Close your eyes and pat yourself on the back and be like, I come from excellence. That's where I am. That's where I've been. In one way or another. Really cool. Okay, so now. Back to Newton and John, who became quite adept at swinging hammer. And as a side note, but not nearly a periphery point, it is central to their being, these guys could knock out bicep curls. They were so good at curls. Almost too good, some might say. So that's Norton's kids for you. Can't stop that, right? Explosive biceps, good vascularity. Heart health, eat beets. So Newton and his brother John were nearly inexhaustible in their enthusiasm for building on the weekends and occasionally taking point on the weekdays while Norton took his wife Ethel out for a romantic picnic. Because Norton never forgot that you got to date your wife the whole way through. Norton was not about to let the romance die. He would occasionally surprise Ethel with a rose and say, you're everything to me, Ethel. I'm going to make the picnic and give you the day off because you always work so hard to do great things for this family. I want to give you recognition, but I also want to make love to you underneath an oak tree. And Ethel would say, behave yourself, Norton. But she would blush the whole time. She didn't mean it. She wanted it. And that's how a lot of kids happen in that family. A lot of copulation underneath oak trees. That's kind of storybook level stuff right there. As you're hearing this, I'd imagine your heart is swelling in your chest in a way that feels both alarming and fulfilling. Funny how that works. But then again, not funny at all because it's real. It feels good. You deserve to feel good, Darby Cast doctors. You do. So what else were Newton and John doing to do their father, Norton, proud? They were passing out Cokes with the transactions at the lumberyard slash cabinet making place slash house building construction business. Oh, they knew. They knew where they came from because they knew where their father came from. Wow. That's what we call passing down the things that matter, that is culture. That is mimetic significance. So there's genetic lineage and there's mimetic lineage. You know what a meme is? It's how culturally relevant information is shared. And some of you right now are saying, well, most memes these days don't really share information on how to be and how to live and how to love. And you're not wrong. But in this family, those were the memes. And they weren't jokes either. They were just raw, real, authentic, sincere. So let's talk about this wonderful house. It was made with all the finest materials, no expense spared, because Norton had access to great materials. Norton, a small business owner, true capitalist, the wood that he was using on his DIY house with his sons, best of the best. But things that he didn't have, high quality nails, screws, didn't have a whole lot of quality glass for all the windows that he wanted to pepper his house with. Sucker for natural light. 
during the day. Guy just loves sunlight. No surprises there. So after a multiplicity of upgrades and remodels, the family had a 17-bedroom estate. And not just that, they had children to fill each room. There was, of course, Olivia, Newton, and John. But then came Ben, David, Norton Jr., Jack, Cecilia, Candace, and a bunch of other children, few of whom are really worth mentioning. And that's not because they were bad people. It's just because they lived fairly ordinary lives. Just imagine great people doing great things and not letting worldly ambition get the best of them. They just wanted to do right by their own families and the people around them. Whoa, boy, is that something that just doesn't really feel like it exists anymore in this world of ours. Remember how Norton would give people a cup of sugar and a 20? When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you said, of course I'll give you a cup of sugar? Would you like brown sugar or white sugar? Do you need flour? What about eggs? Milk? You got enough milk on deck, neighbor? When was the last time you knocked on your neighbor's door and said, let me hand you a 20? You want an Andy Jackson? Do you know what he fought against and why he wasn't successful with it? Are you game for a history lesson, neighbor? Let's play a game of chess over a nice oak barrel aged whiskey. Have you done that? Perhaps not. Add it to the to-do list. 2021 is a new year and January, the whole month, is so important to set your trajectory because good ideas tend to flow early in the year. Remember it. Back to the action. World War II happens. What a mess. All of the children die. Norton and Ethel's children, except Norton Jr. How did everybody meet such an unfortunate end? Well, war is hell. That's how. The men got iced in a couple different ways. Some from direct gunshot wounds, fighting the Nazis. Other from superficial gunshot wounds, leading to sepsis, while the remaining ones simply disappeared, never to be heard from again. And that one, I think, Stalin had a hand in. That mustachioed son of a bitch. Right? Now, a lot of you are asking, and you're so immersed in it that the question arose in your mind, how else did my family die? If you're that into this, I'm going to pat myself on the back for the storytelling. But I'm going to issue you a congratulations for engaging your imagination in a way that you maybe haven't in recent history. Boy, does it feel good to let that thing out of its cage and say, Fly around. I'm sorry I clipped your wings, imagination, you beautiful bird. Fly, soar even. It's okay to do that. It is. Give yourself permission. I'm giving you permission, so give it to yourself. Pass it on. But some of you are wondering, how did the females of my family die? Well, they joined the workforce to pick up the slack for the country, as was their patriotic duty, or so they were told. All of the huge studs, alphas, and a couple of losers were sent off to the war, and that left our economy not looking so great. So you had females who were pleasant, dainty, ladylike, and a whole slew of other feminine words that scream incredible chick. But what did they do? They said, fine, I'm going to put a time out on that and I'm going to become butch. Look at Rosie the Riveter. Look at the way that she rolled those sleeves up and started going to the steel mill. That sounds not quite like my typical speed, but I am a highly adaptive individual who is willing to step up for those that I love. And it's like, Wow, really A-plus stuff, A-plus-plus even. Some of you are still wondering, how did they die? 
Well, they all died in a miserable accident at the ammunition factory that ended in a singular event that only John Wick aficionados could ever really appreciate. Lots of headshots. Lots of damage. So in this scenario, you are the grandchild of Norton and the son or daughter of Norton Jr. And if you hadn't pieced that together already, maybe you just haven't had your coffee yet or maybe something far worse. I don't know. But if you're keeping pace with what's going down here, I think you just came to the conclusion a little bit before I'm even going to say it, because all of the other heirs in the family weren't around to inherit the house, the century-old estate fortuitously happens into your possession. Whoa! Come on down. Tell them what they've won. It's a Price is Right reference for all of you guys who ever stayed home from school on a sick day and got down with Bob Barker. Tell them what they've won. But now that you're caught up on all your privilege as relates to the massive amounts of manual labor and sacrifice that your ancestors put together, which out of all the opportunities for you to not be born in the first place, all of a sudden you're here on the scene. You exist. Somehow you avoided being part of the lineage of one of the aunts and uncles who died as a result of the war. Wow. Wow is right. What a rare opportunity you have to live. And let me just call this out. We're all lucky to be alive and experience the universe and all it has to offer. You already knew that, but I think that's worth mentioning from time to time. Right, Kyle? It is, isn't it? So let's have that party, shall we? That dinner party. And after our history lesson, now we are caught up in the present. It's time for your dinner party. So your spouse is thrilled that so many strangers from so many interesting parts of the globe are showing up at your house. I hope they like what I'm serving tonight, remarks your better half as they tighten their apron that reads, Kiss the Cuck. It normally said kiss the cook, but it's missing some fabric, and now it says kiss the cuck, and it just hasn't been replaced because your spouse just doesn't understand that this is a self-degrading apron, and you think it's pretty funny. You don't tell them about it. You're just like, I need a little something that's just for me in this world. I give up too much. I need to cherish this. So you're in your house and you're nervously pacing and hypothesizing of what sort of potential scenarios might arise from bringing so many strangers together. You're a little bit on edge. Your palms are a little bit sweaty. Heart rate's elevated. Your breathing has gotten a little bit shallow. Your normally amazing vascularity that you inherited from your grandfather and your father. Your veins are constricted, you're dehydrated, and it's clear that you're not your normal self. Your adrenal glands atop your kidneys are pumping a little bit. You're like, what the hell's going to happen? You have a threat matrix. You understand things that other people seem to have forgotten, that situations can sometimes go poorly in this world. And it doesn't matter where somebody else is from, but that can sometimes just add layers of complications to human interaction. So you're a little bit rattled, but you're trying your best to keep you cool. Are you feeling this? Okay. So you venture over to your secret firearm stash just to make sure that you've got that SHTF plan in the event that something spontaneously goes south. Your spouse sees where you're headed and explains that there is no use in looking for your and your family's means of self-defense, many of which were family heirlooms passed down intergenerationally, beginning even before your grandpappy, Norton. And you're like, where are the firearms, babe? And they respond with, 
I gave them to the local police department and requested that you be put on a terror watch list, at least until after the party. You almost get upset, but then your spouse reaches in the kitchen drawer and brandishes the divorce papers that are already completely filled out except for your signature. Your spouse has already signed it, just in case. You don't want to lose this wonderful house, so you hold your tongue. The situation's tense, right? So your husband or your wife, in whatever scenario you're living in, as I wrap your mind in images so vivid that you are beginning to wonder, does this narrator I'm listening to hold the secrets to teleportation and time travel alike? because he is transporting me to times and places that I never knew before. But now that I'm here, it feels all so familiar. What a show. That's what you're thinking. That's what most of you are thinking. I'll take that compliment. Thank you. So your spouse explains to you that this party will be the greatest thing to ever happen to your family and that there's absolutely zero downside to blindly opening your doors to complete and utter strangers with whom you don't have a single mutual relationship. Not even a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. Now think about that. Would you say travel to a different state? Take the international piece about it. Would you ever just travel to another state, waltz into an Arby's, stare down the first random that made eye contact with, ask them for their LinkedIn info, and then you go on there and they're not even friends with any of your connections, that's going to require a full interview before you even begin to think that that person might be a good fit for anything in your life. And chances are they're going to flunk out during the interview process. They're going to completely crap the bed. Maybe your first question, and you realize you have no mutual connections with them, you're like, So what's the best thing at Arby's? And they say the roast beef. And you're like, no, it's not. Strike one. It's the curly fries. Who raised you? That's not even an international thing. That's just you go to a different state. And people are making huge errors like that. Okay. But this is an international party. Remember that. So in anticipation of what will most likely be a unpredictable evening. You, normally somebody who likes to be in full command of your faculties, because you feel so overwhelmed, you say, I'm going to have a couple drinks. And the drinks end up flowing. A couple too many of them. You had hoped that being slightly buzzed would calm your nerves and also help you forget that you married a total moron without any common sense. No such luck. You've had this thought for years and nothing has been able to erase it thus far. You feel stupid for even imagining a scenario where something remotely good would ever happen to you. There's that frosty embrace I talked about in the beginning of the episode. That doesn't feel good. But just you wait. There's more. Boy, is there more to this story? Allow me to continue. Your guests begin to arrive. You begin handing out money, remember, your college fund for your children, to all of them to make them feel as welcome as possible. As the guests arrive, some take their shoes off upon entering the house, others don't, and some guests aren't wearing shoes at all. You try to communicate to everybody, like, this is kind of a shoes-on house, we got a lot of hardwood, you don't have to worry about this. And those of you who aren't wearing shoes, what's, uh... What's really going on? What's that about? You try greeting each guest with a warm hello and a firm handshake for the men and a pleasant smile to the females and the children showing up. This gesture confuses about half of your guests and about half of that half visibly assumes aggressive postures and facial mannerisms. Scowls. Clenched jaws. What a party this is starting out to be, explains your oblivious spouse, who is, in fact, 
far drunker than you and crossfaded on a colorful cocktail of benzodiazepines. Think like Xanax, if you don't know the benzo, full word. Xanax and other stuff. Although your 17-bedroom house is normally quite accommodating, more guests have shown up than you had previously anticipated. You gave out all 250 invites per your spouse's command, thinking that maybe only 50 or so people would show up, but upwards of 5,000 people have gathered in front of your house, many of whom have begun taking the liberty of entering your house through the side yard, avoiding introducing themselves. You almost get flustered by this, but quickly remember that your quote-unquote partner in crime, otherwise known as your spouse, has weaponized your marriage vows against you and isn't afraid to exact their brand of justice upon you if you fuck up and do something as silly as calling out a stranger for trespassing. Shame on you if you think an evil thought like that. That is so messed up. The party's picking up and many of your guests can't find a lavatory. So they start defecating on the lawn, in the pool, into the pool. Quite different from taking a deuce in the pool. Taking a deuce into the pool? Whoa. A couple of the people, actually a lot of people, they're emptying their bells inside the house on the carpets and the furniture. Let's talk about what's being served for dinner. Now that I have stimulated your appetite with talking about feces. Your spouse has made their famous pork tenderloin. One of your favorite dishes that your mother had taught them how to cook expertly, just right. A couple of secret ingredients, a couple of important timing measures to undertake. Make sure that pork is juicy as can be. You bite into it and you get a flavor explosion that would arouse Guy Fieri. And that's putting it really lightly. This pork tenderloin would do such things to Guy Fieri that you wouldn't care to know what the behind the scenes of that episode of his show looked like, if you catch my drift. Inappropriate is what I'm saying. Is the, the things he would do to the pork. He wouldn't consume it all the way with his mouth. Why would he be showing his appreciation to it. And that's all I'm going to say. Because you already understand where this is going. And where it's already been. If this were in fact served to Guy Fieri. So this delicious pork tenderloin. Some of the guests partake. While others take great offense. To the gesture of a pork offering. And despite the mixed reception of. What's normally your favorite dinner dish. There isn't nearly enough food to go around. But that's okay because your house pets have been killed, skinned, and are being spit-roasted over an open fire adjacent to a poop mound in the backyard. Things are chill. It's a pretty relaxed party. You feel devastated. Actually, you now feel incomplete at the loss of your three Labrador retrievers. But your spouse insists that you keep those feelings to yourself lest you want to announce to the guests, quietly or not so quietly, that you are one of the most insensitive pricks the world has ever known. You want to cry, but that's not your speed. You don't do that in public. You don't. You have the capacity for it, but it doesn't happen often. Something's really got to get to you for you to meltdown, whether it's the ending to the movie Homeward Bound, where Shadow and Sassy, the cat, make it all the way back to their loving family, or whether your multiple generations old house is being defiled. Those are mainly, the, those are the two things that get you, that hit you right in the feels. You sprint up the stairs of your family home and you lock yourself in the master bathroom while muttering, this isn't happening, to yourself, repeatedly, hoping that perhaps a quick porn session underneath the comfort of your VR headset will allow you to tune out the chaos around you. Your Wi-Fi network is overwhelmed 
with users posting about how much they hate your party in over 30 different languages, which your spouse finds oddly charming. You, still in the bathroom, frustratedly shout aloud, Come on, load! To which you hear a muffled, that's what she said. You enjoy a quick chuckle right before you realize that the only thing that you really look forward to anymore are rerun marathons of The Office, and that joy isn't really a big part of your life anymore. You quickly revert back to the overwhelming and undeniable dread creeping through every inch of your being. Because you can't seem to escape the negative emotions that are going with the chaos around you, you say to yourself, nah, fuck it, I'm going back downstairs. Might as well just watch the show if all this nonsense is going down, whether I want it to or not. I've lost control. I have no firearms. So you head back downstairs and you find your spouse, who's getting gang-banged by a group of gentlemen. I, I guess that's probably not the right word for it each representing proud countries with strong histories of ethnic cleansing, violence, and low literacy rates. Really magical. That's something else, right? So depending on your gender, as you're listening to this, this beautiful guided meditation that I had promised you and am delivering on in spades, depending on your gender, This is either a gay gang rape or just a gang rape. Your spouse gives you a thumbs up as this is all going down and mouths out the words, I love learning about other cultures, as he or she takes a needle full of heroin and meth to the neck from one of the team players participating in your partner's cultural enrichment seminar. Your spouse shoots you a smug look as if to say, My hospitality is second to none. You throw up in your mouth, some dribbles onto your shirt, but not a lot. You swallow the rest of it. And you walk over to the couch, collapsing in a heap. You're exhausted. Your nerves are fried. What a barrage of physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual fuckery going down. Some of you right now, you Darby cast doctors, are thinking to yourself, wow, you are engaging my senses, but I feel like you've really neglected smell. And to that I say, great anticipation skills. Let me get back to this. Let me get back to the guided visualization slash meditation. Do your olfactory system right. The couch smells like sewage, shawarma, fried rice, tacos, and curry, with a hint of something that you can't quite put your finger on, but makes you think of Buca de Beppo. Also, you can't help but observe how nearly impressively sticky all of the pillows have gotten in such a short time span. Your pillows weren't cummy at all, caked with ejaculate a mere hours earlier. My, my, how quickly things can change, you think, to yourself. You look around at the calamity. Fights have broken out everywhere. Groups that have feuds back where these people typically reside in the world have brought their feuds to your house and have chosen to continue them there, despite you not being all about it. Turns out there's a lot of racism at this party, and you're not dishing out any of it. You're just looking around and you're like, wow, people from around the world fucking hate each other. I didn't quite realize this. This is not my perception of how the world feels about one another. I thought our country just was the only country with racial, ethnic, and sectarian whodunitry in the world. But lo and behold, it seems like these people from Cambodia over in the corner there are too fond of the Chinese that are across the way. And what the hell's going on with the Indians and the Pakistanis? They are looking at each other menacingly. And what of the Spaniards and the Portuguese? 
What in heaven's name have they got against one another? Could it be that places all over the globe have shared history of violent conflict and that it's not just in this country like I always see in the news and on movies and commercials? This couldn't be. My senses are betraying me, you think to yourself, but you don't actually believe it. You're like, yeah, this makes sense. More and more fights continue to break out. You've lost control of your house. You've lost control of the situation. And you notice that everything in your house that wasn't bolted down seems to be missing. And then, out of nowhere, you get raped. It's a bummer. Also, I have failed to mention that your kids have long since been murdered. And you can't help but think that this party might not have been as good of a call as your spouse had proclaimed. Let me take you back to your nose. You smell smoke. Without seeing a single flame, you know that the house is on fire and that in a short time span, everything that your family, multiple generations before you, had worked so hard to create was about to go the way of the pterodactyl. You hear your spouse cry out to you, We should do this every weekend! This rocks! You give no response. You know there won't be anything left of the house in an hour or so. You manage to pull yourself off the sticky couch and walk out to the front yard just in time to see the whole thing burst into flames. Your spouse is taking point on being on the receiving end of another gangbang while winking at you with assertiveness. That or possibly just having involuntary myofascial spasms from the copious amounts of illicit substances that they've ingested over the past few hours, coupled with quite a bit of emotional trauma and rectal carnage. I think that messes a person up a little bit. I think. Not sure. Don't quote me on that. You shrug and quickly think back to your wedding ceremony, officiated by your heavenly betrothed ex fiance who insisted that they be the one to kiss your spouse after the wedding vows. Your stomach tightens as you remember how enthusiastically you agreed to the proposition. What the hell was that about, you ask yourself? You glance back at the house. Tons of people die inside as your family's physical legacy expeditiously collapses into a smoldering heap of embers and brokenness. Some billionaires show up and they begin high-fiving each other. And they look over at you and they say, Why the long face, man? Aren't you... Throw on a smile. And you're just like, whoa, what? I don't get it. What the hell just happened? Happened so quickly. Lincoln Park songs begin involuntarily playing in your head. No music, but everything's there in your head. And many of you listening to this right now, Darby Cast Doctors, what just fired in your brain? That's right. One thing. I don't know why. You know the rest, right? The billionaires are self-congratulatory in their attitudes. They remark to one another, Hey, good job on those ad campaigns that gave that person's spouse the idea for this crazy party. It was a good ad campaign. A lot of clicks. Pretty cool. Then... A helicopter lands and Lady Gaga and Cardi B show up to deliver a message of peace, love, and unity, which everybody needs, but you don't find appropriate. They sing a remix of Bad Romance and W.A.P. Wet Ass Pussy. And it sounds awful, as you'd imagine it would. How could those terrible songs come together to make something good? Boy, is that a big takeaway. You take 
multiple crap things and you put them together, two negatives don't make a positive. This isn't a math equation, right? Mathematicians of Darby Cast, you understand. Even the non-mathematicians of Darby Cast get that. A party is not a math equation. And two negatives don't make a positive. Then out of nowhere comes Phil Knight, the CEO of Nike. And he gives you a pair of Jordans and a deep fried beetle burger. He says, eat the bugs. It's for the environment. Where are the Jordans? Eat the bugs. And you're like, can I just have a minute? That, that's what you say to him. You're like, Phil, I don't know you uh, super well. What you're doing right now, rushing me through the most devastating events of my life, I'm not really okay with it. I'd rather talk with somebody that isn't you. And he's offended by that. And you're like, how is that not computing with you? You are a complete stranger, Phil. I don't really wear Jordans. More of a Converse guy. You know, Phil. Jordan wore Converse before he went with you. So suck on that, Phil. And you walk away. Before you know it, another interruption. And what's it this time? It's a three-foot penis-seeking BJ robot that goes up to you and insists that it's time for a suck J. And you're like, ah, I'm going to pass. I'm not really in the mood. But then the robot using its AI is like, I'll come back when it makes sense. I get you. You're like, do you? Do you? Three foot penis seeking BJ robot. Do you understand me? Do you understand what's going on right now? Then, of course, the news vans arrive and begin discoing their story that puts you as the antagonist of the whole shebang. They say, had this person simply thrown a good party, been more inviting, and treated everybody how they would like to be treated based on their hundreds, if not thousands of different particularities of their customs that go with their regions, countries, states, cities, and families. Like, had you just known about how everybody does things everywhere in the world, maybe this wouldn't have happened to you. You idiot. Be a better host. You suck at hosting parties. And they cut back to Rachel Maddow in the studio, who adjusts her thick glasses and says, fuck that guy, right? Or fuck that gal. And Rachel, she's talking about you. Whoa. The billionaires, who seem to be way too pleased by all of the violence that has taken place, they agree with all the reporters and they're like, yeah, this one's on you. This one is totally on you. You're a bad host. You are the worst host. And you're like, but what about the guests? Aren't they supposed to like act okay when they show up at a party? What's that about? And boy, did the billionaires get upset when you say that. They're like, how dare you? But then who shows up? Elon Musk, that's right. He shows up and he says, I'm so sorry, sir or ma'am. He's talking to you. He's like, I'm not really in with these other billionaires. I don't like them. And you're like, Elon, I knew you were a good guy. Thanks for saying that, Elon. And then you think real quick on your feet because you're smart, sort of. Not in this scenario, really, though. Everything that's just happened, you kind of blew it in a huge way, in a lot of ways. You look over at Elon and you're like, can you help me rebuild this house? I don't have a whole lot of money. My life is ruined. My life, my livelihood. That's my spouse over there. You know, you see the individual doing triple anal. That's who I chose to marry. Elon throws up in his mouth a little bit, a little spills out, but he guts the rest. And he says to you, he says, well, I guess I could help you rebuild a house, but not this house. This house was priceless. It cannot be replaced. Important things happened here. Really important things. And you kind of dropped the ball. And I'm going easy on you. You just go, whoa. But you already knew that. You already knew what Elon told you. You just 
kind of needed somebody else to hammer home the point to really solidify the thought. They're like, ugh, man. So that's just going to wrap it up for the Darby cast on this Wild Card Friday. Whoa! What a Wild Card Friday. And a lot of you are probably saying, like, why did you end it on a frosty hug and not a warm one? Because that's life. Oh, boy. Not all stories have happy endings. And perhaps the glorious, triumphant continuation of this story, if I so choose to perpetuate it, maybe then you shall have the hug that you so crave. But let me leave you with a question before you have your weekend. And like I've said before with the Darby cast, perhaps you are listening to this not on a Friday, but a different day. So for the rest of your day, you might have some things to think about and some questions to ask and some feelings to process. I pray that you do. I pray that you don't just turn this off and immediately say, all right, time to turn on an episode of The Voice. I don't know if you watch that. You probably don't. I don't watch it, so I can make the reasonable assumption that it's not really for me. And because you're into the Darby cast, it's probably not really for you either. Do you see the transitive property that was just employed? Very cool. But let me end on a couple questions. In this whole scenario, who was at fault? Who was most at fault? Because I think a lot of whodunits occurred. I don't know if there's just a single individual we can place this upon. So whose fault was it? The most. Who messed up the most? Was it the guests? Was it your spouse for coming up with the idea for this kickback? Was it yours for going along with it? Was it yours for linking up with your spouse in the first place? Was it your parents, Norton Jr. and his wife, Carol, for bequeathing you with the responsibility of looking after such an amazing house with so much history? Was it your grandpappy? Was it Norton for having that insane idea of creating something with both immediate as well as lasting significance and utility? Was it nobody's fault? Was it everyone's fault? Is it too close to call? Where do the rich fat cats come into play? Where do the news people come into play? All food for thought. As delicious as that pork tenderloin that Guy Fieri would have violated with his penis. There, I said it. But that's Darby Cast for you. That is Wild Card Friday. Enjoy your weekend. You're great. Here's the challenge for the weekend. If you're feeling weird right now, if you're feeling a little off, if you're feeling a little blue, see how quickly you can turn that around to become a shining beacon of positivity to go up to a stranger and pass on the good vibes and be like, I can transmute negativity. I am a emotional alchemist. Give me anything and I shall turn it into positivity. That is the challenge that I issue to you. Until next time, DarbyCast doctors.